Um, let's get started. We usually have a few more people to join us, <clears throat> but we'll get through the pre preamble at the beginning because I always have to do a little bit of an introduction for anybody who's new here. My name's Norma Jean, and this is the National Life Force Canada Education Think Tank. And Life Force Canada is more than just education. Our mission is to protect our freedoms and our rights. So we're a platform that's made up of Canadians from across the nation who all volunteer their time and their energy to help create the Canadian Restoration Plan, which is an empowered future for all of us. So we work together uh, and collaboratively as a nation, and we work separately as provinces, and we work individually as counties, but always with the same purpose of creating a restoration plan for the new earth. And we have nine pillars in Life Force Canada. Education is just one of them. It's my personal favorite. But if you haven't already, we encourage you to um, join Life Force Canada and learn more about the many amazing initiatives that we have going on throughout the whole country. It's pretty impressive, actually. I'm a former public school employee for 20 years. Oops, there's somebody in the waiting room. Um, and I'm also the mom of two growing young men who both struggle to be successful in the current uh, school system. And so I know the system from the inside and the out, and I have seen its many shortcomings, and that's why I became the facilitator of this think tank. <clears throat> I think we all recognize that we are long overdue to move away from this current model of education that promotes competition and comparison to one of collaboration and contributionism. So we all have gifts, and uh, they should be developed and shared with the world, and that's what education should be about. So this education think tank was created to support all of us. So whether you're a parent, a teacher, administrator, support staff, or just simply someone who cares about the future of our children and really the future of humanity. So we're looking at, we need a new vision, a vision and that's why we meet each week. And we're, we're looking at bringing people together who are passionate about education and children and who want to create change. So I do see a few new uh, phases here. So I'm just gonna quickly tell you about our education portal that we created through the Think Tank here. It's a database backed website where you can go to either search for um, support if you're homeschooling or wanna develop a learning um, pod or micro school, or you're looking for an educator to help you, or you're looking for resources, or you're an educator and you wanna um, offer services whether that's traditional academia or you have something else in mind, like maybe you're a gardening guru or you wanna teach meditation to children or, anyways, that's, um, it's a really simple, go on, search for what you're looking for and it helps you connect with who you're looking for. And it's free. So um, I invite you to uh, have a look at it. I'm going to put the, um, the link in the chat a little bit later. Hi, Grace. And, um, and then I'll leave that with you guys to just go ahead and check out. There's a reactions button down at the bottom. And if you want to speak or have a comment or a question, we ask that you just raise your hand. It just seems to be the most efficient way that we can make sure that everybody gets an opportunity to speak. And before we get started with the meeting, um, I see we have some new faces here tonight, which is wonderful. We're always so happy to have new faces. So I'd like to welcome you to just take and um, take a few minutes now for everyone who's new tonight to just introduce themselves and tell us where you're from and, you know, maybe what role you play in education, if at all, if you're a parent or a teacher and what brought you here tonight. So can we start, Joseph, can we start with you, Joseph? I was going to volunteer. You read my mind. I love it. <laughs> I was going to raise hand. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm Joseph. Uh, I have a very extensive background, uh, despite my age. So um, I did martial arts for many years. I was a uh, head instructor, so I taught over the Lower Mainland, different provinces, and I did self-defense for children, teenagers, adults, women, seniors. Um, so I did that, and then I got into uh, special needs education. I got my degree uh, that was my first degree, actually, and I taught in the Surrey School District from uh, K to 12, worked with learning disability, special needs. I learned a lot of how that world's been. Uh, we'll talk about it later, but it needs a lot of support, very underfunded. And I'm currently getting my second degree so I can teach, hopefully, internationally in uh, more of a widespread um, view. So whether it be college or maybe even a TED Talks, but I'm working towards that. So 
lots of learning, lots of education, and uh, I love learning more. So, well, oh, right on. Yeah, wow. sorry, it's a mouthful, but that's that's, that's my short resume. Yeah, no, we're, we're happy to have you. I I was in special ed for uh, twenty years. I still am, and I do VI work, and I do um, Orton Gillingham, an Orton Gillingham trainer. I don't know if you're familiar with them. A little bit. Yeah, but VI um, work is rewarding, but it's challenging. So it can be, yeah, it can yeah. be for sure. But it, it is rewarding, and I do enjoy yeah. it. Yeah. But what I'm doing now is workshops. I help parents uh, learn how to teach their kids, support, support them in their reading and their learning and stuff. And, uh, I love that. That's, and to me, I reach way more kids when I teach adults. So I do professional development. Work with adults. I'd, love, I'd love to help you one day. I like teaming up. I'm walk through. As soon as I'm around, Definitely. I'll start talking. I'm just going to mute you. There we go. Um, I Sorry. Yeah, I was going to say, I like, no, I couldn't hear with Grace, but I was going to say, I like teaming up with people. So hopefully one day we can collaborate together and go from there. Love that. Absolutely. And you're in the lower mainland. So me too. That's yeah. perfect. Um, Padia, I, I'm not sure if you've been here before or not. You look familiar. Hi, this is my first time. Oh, yay. Welcome. Thank you. Super, super excited to find this group. And um, I only discovered, um, the interview with Kim Gogan and um, United Network News, and I've been just exploring all of it, all of it, all of it for the last couple, maybe two weeks at the most, maybe a week. Mm -hmm. And so I'm very, very interested in everything uh, this is about. And um, I have a passion for education. Um, I've lived on a small island, Cortez Island in British Columbia for most of my adult years, about 30 years. And um, I raised my daughter here. Um, she went to an alternative school called Linnea School and it was set on a, on a farm where I, I came here to study organic gardening and I've been doing that ever since. Um, but I've, um, I always felt like one of the contributions to the world that I wanted to give is to create a new education system you know, based on life skills and whole, whole being skills. Um, so I've been working with kids in uh, creating alternative education just here on, on the island, um, little Cortez Island. And I do um, see my specialty is, um, gosh, well, I'm, I'm a Brima bodywork instructor, which is like teaching the nine universal principles of harmony, like how to be present in your daily life. And I teach uh, West African drumming. So it's basically unity, having experience of unity through, through music and song, but based on West African tradition. And um, I do, um, I love, ultimate frisbee as a sport, you know, and I do after school sports with kids. I have, um, we've created, um, I stopped working at the community hall um, play school because of mask mandates. And so we created an out, outdoor play school this year called Nature Play, which is awesome. And um, another after school program with the kindergarten age doing crafts outside and I have a uh, homeschool storytelling class. I have a group between seven and maybe seven and 11 year olds basically who come over and we explore all kinds of creative expressive arts and storytelling. And, um, and I just, um, I'm, I wrote a book called The Art of Sacred Gardening, Creating Beauty and Abundance and Harmony with Nature. And I'm, um, I want to dedicate everything, my whole life and everything to uh, creating a new world. And that's what I came here for. And I feel like now's the time and just want to plug in. I want to help. I want to use my hands and my mind and my creativity, everything I have to do that. And I need the people. I need to plug in, you know. <laughs> well, you found them. <laughs> Yay. I'm excited for sure and if there if you want to uh, expand you know you're welcome to place an ad or place a listing it's not really an ad it's more of a listing on the um on the portal to let people 
to make to build awareness around what you're doing and eventually it might even become something that you can market and sell as a curriculum and or maybe you've already done that i don't know oh and i forgot to mention a big thing i've been um creating a um summer youth program every summer here for the last maybe eight years um with just gathering adults who want to offer um any kind of uh, sports or creative or skill building workshops. I, I just put that all together for July and August. So we've been doing that. So and so do kids come over from the mainland to participate in that? Is it like um well there's a lot of people that come here for the summer just for vacation. And so what's really great about it is it blends the, right. the local kids with the summer kids. And so it's a win-win, you know, they get to meet new people and play together and, and do activities together. Awesome. Um, so yeah, I haven't had people from off island coming over just for that, mainly just because they're here. But maybe you would. I would, I would do whatever is needed. Yeah, if people knew about it, you never know, they might actually plan their family vacation around that, right? Yeah, that's. Well, welcome us. It's awesome to hear all the amazing things you're already doing, Claudia. We, uh, we appreciate you joining us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Layla, you have been here, but this is the first time we've seen your lovely face. Yeah, I, I feel like I, you didn't have video last time. Okay, maybe something. Yeah, uh, I was only here once um, last week. I met, uh, I, I heard uh, James Griffin, is it? Yeah, yeah. Talk. I was so floored by it that I ordered his book. Yeah, <laughs> I, I did to pick it up tomorrow. <laughs> um, so we'll see how I, I find, I think I'll be very inspired by that. I'm just a mom. Um, I have, I have an artistic background between photography, a bit, a bit of painting and stuff, um, but, uh, and jewelry making, but I also, I, I, I have a little bit of teaching background, teaching adults in the past, um, but now my son, who's 11, I had him in French school for years and years and years, um, but now this is the first year where I put him into Waldorf, thinking, experiential learning outside using it you know no 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 yeah but they're they're uh they follow tvsb they follow all of the you know public health protocol blah 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 and mm. i am like trying not to lose my mind trying not to like do you guys really believe this do you actually you know, when the principal writes a note to all parents saying, you know, Toronto Public Health, you know, is quite transparent and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, what? what do you actually believe there's a virus? Or what, what, what are you talking? Anyways, so I'm just reaching out to other people, other, you know, I have a couple of telegram, uh, telegram groups and I'm like trying not to lose my mind and I'm finding, meeting great people kind of and, and I hear this story re repeatedly that you know kind of losing or not really talking to some old friends making new friends and mm -hmm. we're um, all finding our tribe aren't we yeah yeah exactly. but you're in the Toronto area then or? I am in Toronto yeah okay I, yeah. so I can I can hook you up with a couple of options in Toronto uh, yeah. and they're really great and you can even go back and watch some recordings so um you gave me your email last week I put yeah. it in the in the subscriber list but if you put it in the chat again tonight I'll I'll take it personally and I will send you some information about okay. some amazing learning pods that are happening in your area thank you that's what I started looking towards and thinking for next and this is great in a way will do better than you know whatever yeah, they, they're using uh well a combination of things the one I'm thinking of but you'll also find them on the education portal as well they're called roots and wings and and then uh -huh. another fellow who's I don't think he's taking any students right now but there's another one called evergreen learning center or sorry evergreen leadership academy uh -huh. and so anyways if you have a look on there that would be great it would give you some options because there's quite a few things happening in the Toronto area okay I would love to hear about that i've been looking i've been in telegram and, or in this um ontario freedom network or something hosted by don don co something. oh yes yeah and he has a list of schools and stuff but i keep looking i keep looking for something in the area i can't find anything though. oh I'll try roots and wings definitely sorry norma jean can i uh i'm okay i'm writing this down now but you are i'm also going to tell uh, give you my uh my my email yeah chat 
what else did you say? Roots and Wings and also Evergreen something? Leadership Academy. Leadership Academy. Okay. But he's in, uh, Brian, do you remember where Simon's school is? It's in Halton, I think, maybe. Mm -hmm. It might be too far. I don't recall. <clears throat> yeah, I can't quite remember. I don't know Ontario all that well. But oh, anyways, um, are you all in BC? Uh, no, we're all over. We're all over oh, the place. Okay. 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 Yeah, we're from all across Canada. We have uh, actually, um, I think that's everybody that's new tonight, right? Yeah. Okay. So let's. Um, oh, sorry, DK. Yeah. If I may, um, since you asked, because I wrote an article on each of those two, um, Roots yeah. and Wings and uh, Simon. So what I'll do is, you're familiar with the chat. I'm assuming. I'm um, sorry, Lila. Like Lila. Lila. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I'll put those links in the Zoom chat. Oh, and thank you. Thank you. It'll, yeah, um, Roots and Wings is like all over, well, I shouldn't say all over, but they have like, I think, 30-something throughout. Ontario and a couple in Quebec, yeah, I think 30 yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'll just put them in the in the chat. Thank you so much. Yeah. DK, Thank is it? Thanks, yeah, DK. DK. Appreciate it. All right, so we are uh, very honored to be joined by Shauna Robinson tonight. She is an award-winning children's author and a rookie homeschooler mom. Um, her family's homeschool journey began in September of 2021, so not that long ago, but it was spurred on by the need to put fun, freedom, and flexibility back into learning as a response to the glaring gaps in her daughter's uh, educational experiences of the previous two years. So that sounds familiar, I'm sure, to a lot of people. Um, Shauna merges her unique style of short stories, which she's written, with homeschool curriculum ideas through her blog, and she provides a variety of um, ways that stories can support learning, and it can develop critical thinking skills and refine creative abilities. So she believes that the imagination is the workshop of creation, and she nurtures this through a commitment to <clears throat> illustration-free stories, which I'm really excited to hear more about that for school age kids between five and 12 years old. So Shauna has a blog. I'm gonna put some links in the chat for you guys. Um, she has a blog that, that she writes all kinds of stuff for that's wonderful. And she's also got a digital library. So I'll give you her website address as well. So again, I wanna thank you Shauna for joining us this evening. It's a real treat to hear from um, you know, someone who's in the trenches right now and, uh, and taking it on. So thank you for being here. Oh, well, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm, I'm really grateful to be here and share this uh, because I hope through some of our experiences and the ups and downs and challenges and even maybe some of the tools that I have on offer, uh, it can be of support to anyone thinking that they might want to homeschool or uncertain about how to do it or somebody looking at an alternative way of sharing and learning. Uh, when I was, I'm going to spend probably about 15 minutes, and what I'd like to do is give you a, a little bit of an intro about me, a little bit more information, and I would actually like to, if possible, share my screen and just walk you through the library and the blog to be really transparent and clear about how some of these tools could work, um, and then uh, I have an exciting little announcement to share with you at the end, so... Um, does that sound good, Norma Jean? About 15 minutes? Yeah, 15, 20, 25, anywhere in there, okay. whatever you're comfortable with. And yeah, we'd love to see um, what you've got cooking. Awesome. Thank awesome. You. Thank you. Well, like Norma Jean said, our homeschool experience started in September. Uh, we're here in Calgary, Alberta. But I think that um, like many parents toying with this idea, the decision was made separately in my head than it was in my heart. So the decision to homeschool our daughters who are nine in grade four and 11 in grade six was something that became really obvious when my youngest would be wanting to be independent working on her computer. And so she'd go and have her quiet space to jump online to be part of her class. And I get messages from the teacher saying, I haven't seen your daughter all week. It's totally cool if your family needs to step back. Like I get it. And I'm like, but I've actually seen her. She's online and she's logging in. But then she'd log out and look at YouTube videos. So, you know, we had that. That was, that was kind of fun. And then we also had some cohort challenges. The children were placed in cohorts and unable to socialize with their friends. Uh, we had months and months of tears. And we also had, my oldest had, um, her teachers were quite paralyzed with fear about what was going on in the outside world. 
And we are not afraid of what's going on in the outside world. And so having such a strong personality and a difference of opinion, um, she was being presented as perhaps being disobedient or resentful. And she was really responding to her own body and saying, this doesn't feel right. I'm, I'm not fearful. I, I'm not going to follow these things that you're asking me to do that I think are ridiculous. And we wholeheartedly, of course, supported her in that. So the decision to homeschool was made as a family after they completed school last year, even though I had already researched a board, I had already started looking at curriculum and gotten really excited about the opportunity to custom make and tailor make the education to our girls' strengths and interests. And we are very, you know, very blessed that our girls are extremely bright and creative um, and, and learning for them comes very easily. And I know that's not the case with all kids. We're very blessed. And so the summer became this really interesting opportunity to ask them, what do you want to learn? What are you interested in? And how do you want to go about doing it? So we were very lucky to find a homeschool board. Um, um, I will use their name. I love them. It's Wisdom Home Education. Um, they are fully 100% supportive of parents. So whatever you choose to do as a parent, the facilitators in our homeschool board are absolutely phenomenal. What can we do to support you? How are you delivering it? Do you need any suggestions? And if not, they're hands off. They offer a variety of online programs um, that engage in Socratic dialogue. So our 11-year-old daughter, who is has been passionate about Greek mythology for most of her life, is taking an online course in Greek mythology. It's a parent-child course for 10 to 12-year-olds. And it is, it's blowing my mind because I've never really studied it. And it's absolutely phenomenal. What I also will say is that um, we are not Christian in our beliefs. Many people within the wisdom community are particularly the facilitators of these courses, but I'm really, I think it's wonderful, the openness of different points of view that come up in dialogue. Um, and so I have felt very embraced and my daughter also has felt uh, very brave to be able to share her point of view that is not rooted in scripture or in sin or whatever the theme is that doesn't align with, with, with how we, we operate. So uh, I would say at this point, um, we're thriving, we're flowing, um, and perhaps the greatest gift of our homeschooling journey so far has been the ability to take the time to really nurture the feelings that we've been going through. So in Alberta, we instituted the REP program in September, which required a piece of paper to be shown to gain access to certain facilities that had proof of your private medical choice of which is not in alignment for our family. So we actually pulled our girls from every activity that offered this particular protocol or required it. So we left five years of musical theater and four years of hockey and a piano studio we've been at and homeschooling offered us the ability to sit with that grief and those feelings. And it really early on showed me how powerful it can be when you have the time to spend on those things that are connected to our values as a family and also the really the experiences that our that our kids are going through so that has been a huge a huge blessing for us as well so that's our sort of homeschool snapshot and as i was uh, I'll, I'll give you a little bit about my career i guess so i am an author a children's author and I believe that short stories and stories are absolutely um, a fundamental part of being human. And it is a glaring gap in the literature that I have seen for children. They go from picture books to sort of maybe some little early chapter books, and then parents just sort of stop reading to their kids and they're expected to read on their own and just, you know, go to the library, read, and, and parents kind of step back. And I kind of go, well, wh wh why? Because when we cultivate that presence of sharing a story, we're practicing skills to listen and respond and engage with whomever we're talking to in a social environment. So for me, this notion of storytelling and sharing stories is so, so important. And my imagination is, is unusual and I'm a bit of an animist and everything has thoughts and feelings around me and, you know, I'm deeply connected to the elemental kingdom. And so 
my style of stories, I, I kind of reached a point in my, in my life where I'm like, maybe other people want to explore, you know, these wild and wonderful things that go on in my head. I, I think I have something that might be of interest. And so about four years ago, I opened a website called Everyday Icing, because I believe that sharing a story should be the sweetest part of your day. My background is also in advertising. And so I spent years writing radio scripts and timing things out. And it just made sense to me as a parent, and my, my girls were quite a bit younger at the time, that we should be able to choose how long a story is. I wanna know if it's five, 10 or 15 minutes because my girls always ask for one more story. And I wanna be able to say, yes, but you can only pick from the five minute stories or perhaps if we have a lot of time, we've got 15. So everyday icing stories are intentionally written and, and categorized into five, 10 and 15 minute categories. So additionally, if you are a busy parent, if you are a babysitter, a grandparent, anyone, and you only have five minutes, I guarantee you, I will make it magical for you. So you, there's no, there's no guilt. There's no shame in just saying, I only have five minutes. You got a whole bunch to choose from. So everyday icing, um, if I may uh, share my screen, I can show you the website and give you a little bit of insight into what that looks like. So I'm gonna hit share screen and I'm going to go right here. There we go. So everyday icing um, also is built upon the premise that no adult can ever draw anything better than what a kid can imagine. And so I feel as though there is absolutely a time and a place for illustration. There is a time and a place for those beautiful, you know, juicy graphics that you just want to like bathe in. But there also comes a point when we need kids to start thinking for themselves and engaging with their own intuitive and imaginative abilities. And it's shocking to me. I have done hundreds of hours of story time and it blows my mind how many kids kind of check out because there isn't a picture to anchor them. But when we kind of walk through a little bit of a process and I get them sort of back into their own bodies, then it becomes like a really great experience because they're rewarding themselves for utilizing all of their senses seen and unseen to engage themselves in a story. So I am committed to short stories that have no illustrations, just these beautiful hand-drawn little icons as you can sort of see as we scroll through. Um, they're all done, each icon, is connected to a story. So it's a little teaser maybe that will give you a clue to connect you into the story. So this one, for example, is a chameleon tale. So the story is about this magical chameleon and you see the tale and it kind of gets you started. So the website itself is sort of the hub of the blog. So all of the stories will be found here. And what's really cool about the Everyday Icing Library is that it's an incredibly safe place. So I tell parents all the time if they subscribe, you know, log your kids in and leave them because there's nothing in here. There's no ads. There's nothing in here that is going to derail them. So the library itself is organized into 5, 10, and 15 minutes. So if I click on a five-minute story because that's all I have time for, I'm given a little icon and I'm given a title. And, you know, it's really, really visual and, and slightly whimsical, which I think is important, right? Let's not grow up too fast. And the other thing about the library that's really interesting is that after I published my first book, I had the opportunity to go into the studio and record those stories. So there are 24 professionally recorded audio versions of the stories that you can read along with. So if I go down here, the happy pine tree, for example, it has the little play icon, which tells you that audio is available. And if you click on the story, there will be a player that opens up at the top of the story. Each story opens in a new window um, and it's all this beautiful big font that's really easy to read on all sorts of devices. Um, and uh, you can hit play. And if you have an emerging reader or a young reader, or you're just tired, or you want to have sort of that experience of both the audio and the visual, depending on what is what is the, of, of appeal, you have that option. So I, um, I'm quite excited to be able to offer the audio stories because I know at bedtime um, or perhaps even, um, you know, shifting gears, coming home, put it on play, make dinner. There's a lot of, there's a time and a place as well for the audio story. And I think it's really important to appeal to all different types of, of learning. 
The other thing I have in here, and they are um, mostly in the uh, 10 minute category or 15 minute category, are story time meditations. So uh, my daughters are very tuned in spiritually. And so being able to offer them a set of tools and skills to um, understand what's going on with them and maybe connect a little bit better. I started telling them these meditations and then it became all of a sudden I've written 38 of them. I was delivering them live on Saturday mornings on a yoga platform and I covered everything from spirit animals to universal law to grounding and shielding techniques and my whole spiritual toolkit literally poured out into these meditations. And so I currently have four of them in the library. Um, they're all spirit animal meditations in the library. Um, and it's something that I'm going to be um, bringing into the blog with a little bit more, a little more meat on the bone, so to speak, um, to offer ways of integrating uh, story time meditation. Because the same part of our brain that we use to meditate is sort of the part of the brain that you use to visualize something or to imagine something. And so when you do it with children in, in a way that's innately easy for them, it becomes more of a skill set that they can practice and hone. So the Everyday Icing Library has over 100 stories, 24 audio stories, and currently four meditations that will be growing. Um, and I really see this as sort of the hub of, of what I offer. So now I'll take you to the blog. The blog was something that um, became an inspiration. I have a, a very good friend. She's brilliant. She is a former teacher and librarian. And we've connected in so many ways. And she said, you know, Shauna, your stories are, there's so much in your stories. What if you created a way to use it as a tool, to use the story as the beginning of the learning or the lesson or connection to the curriculum? And that really resonated with me because if we look at indigenous cultures around the world, stories have always been the tool for teaching right? Don't go into the waves because the sea monster will swallow you up and you can't, you know, break that tree, that branch off the tree or the tree is going to fall down on our, on our house, right? Story has, has, is always such a memorable way of being engaged with the world around us that I thought, you know what, my, my stories are, are really rich. I've made a point of making sure that an everyday icing story ha is, is broad enough that if you want to extrapolate themes or messages or ideas from it, you can but yet they're also fun enough that you don't feel like you're getting beat over the head with a political, environmental, socially responsible, religious message, right? I think stories have to have in my pocket of everyday icing that place of joy. And so um, the blog has become that place of joy for me to be able to articulate and share a little bit more of what these stories are about. So um, the three seals on the website are connected to the three awards that the everyday icing um, book one, one last year. This is um, recognition from a U.S. company called Story Monsters, Inc. Um, and they are basically a panel of teachers, librarians, uh, students, and parents um, who have a variety of, uh, they have a variety of different categories. And the one on here that's probably most um, meaningful for me is the Purple Dragonfly, which is first place in the children's short story collection. So it received the top honor in that category. And that to me was just was, was really beautiful to see that that was recognized by others. Um, and then the blog itself um, is, is, it's a blog, it's our journey, it's how I'm learning as I go, and most importantly, engaging with stories. So I have three things to share with you from the blog. And then if you choose to explore it on your own, there'll be more gems that come. The first part of the blog is this story guide, which is the Everyday Icing Catalog. So what I've done is I have gone through and created a master catalog so that if you are looking for something very specific to connect with your curriculum, you can open up this Dropbox file and you get this massive Excel spreadsheet and it's all 108 stories and it's broken down into all of these different categories. So you've got your title, you've got how long it takes to read aloud, the format, a two sentence description, it's genre, the subjects that you will be able to connect it to, um, 
the topic, right? If you want a topic on friendship, I've got those animal stories, you, you name it. Like I, I cover pretty much everything. <laughs> specific themes and keywords if you are looking for a tie-in to a unit that you're working on. Um, I will also list all of the protagonists so that you have an idea before you get into that story of who it is or what it is that's going to be delivering it to you. And then we also have word count as well um, and whether or not there's an audio file present because um, that can also be a great tool. I've also kept the drop-down tab available in this document so that you can see the range of what it is that is on offer. So you can see all of the subjects that it's connected with, all the different themes. Um, so I've left that in there so that if you really want to get specific with your story, you can, you can connect um, through that catalog. And now the, an example of um, using stories in our homeschool curriculum is a blog post that I've written. This might be a great place to start. And as I was thinking about um, this presentation today, uh, I feel as though, you know, you've got your de-schooling and your unschooling and your world schooling and your game schooling. I want to call this story schooling because I think that we can like, you know, get a whole community of people together who want to like story school and use that as the launching point. And so if it's something you're curious about, this specific blog post on how I build stories into our curriculum um, gives you six tips and six tools of ways that it works for me. So whether it's a read aloud, a reset button, um, you know, connecting to curriculum, problem solving, you know, critical thinking. I always love having discussion questions that come out of stories and I, and I prompt that and, and even confidence building. So um, this would be a post that I'd like to draw your attention to. And then as an example of a more specific tailor-made topic on what I like to explore would be something like this. So the story that I wrote, for example, is called Suburban Dogs, and the topic is integrating your family dog in your homeschool writing program. So I absolutely love, love, love our dog. We have a big standard poodle. Here he is. This is Ray. And, uh, and so I, the story was actually inspired by him on a walk with my daughter. And I figured, well, you know, maybe that would be another great way to experience um, some writing with kids who are maybe reluctant, who maybe don't want to just sit and do a workbook. So how would you go about doing it? So this was something I did with our girls. It was a combination of how the story was written in the first place, uh, combined with, you know, really drilling it down. And then I've got some, you know, different examples on how you can use it for different ages, whether you've got a young writer, a more confident writer, or reluctant writer how you can tie it into grammar. You know, th th these are things that are really how, how I teach. I'm actually the child of two teachers who, believe it or not, don't support our homeschooling journey. But yet I really believe that some of these basics and, and some of this is, is really important. So I want to inspire other people to sort of intuitively listen to themselves and use what's around them and the stories that are relevant in their own lives to connect into, um, connect into their work. So I have the examples on the story. I pull the story details from that catalog into each blog post so that you have a quick um, a hit here. And then in many of the stories, I also have discussion questions so that if you're going through that story and using it in your own curriculum, you could even use that as, a, as an icebreaker for some of the stories. So that's a, a really quick overview of what everyday icing is. Um, like I said, I sincerely believe that sharing a story should be the sweetest part of your day. And I, I love the notion of stories as a really accessible way to give parents confidence for homeschooling. I mean, we can all read a story. Kids love listening to stories. Gosh, it makes them feel so special when you dedicate that time to them. So why not use that as part of your school experience? We made it very clear with our girls that I'm not a teacher, I'm a guide. And so as we go through our day and we really flow with things, um, stories happen all the time. So I even have in here a uh, little read, read, read aloud reviews of what we're reading as a family and, and connecting that in as well. And hopefully that that can be some, some inspiration. So I think that's, that's a pretty long overview of all of the bits and pieces. Um, but I just wanted to um, share these tools. And then I do have... Um, my storybook. This is the Everyday Icing storybook. Um, it's, it's different than most books. I think 
uh, when I launched this book in 2019, it felt to me like it's a modern take on a classic storybook. You know, you used to have anthologies of fairy tales or, you know, Grimm's or whatever, they would be just stories. And then they, stories over time just became heavily illustrated and that art component became so huge. And I didn't want to do that. I also wanted to create a book that had some really unique features to be very specific to a read aloud experience. So this book is massive. Like this is an eight by 10 book. So if you are sitting on your couch and you have a child on your lap, you can fit them on your lap inside your arms and you can hold this book in front of you. I also intentionally made the font really big. So if you have tired eyes at the end of the day, awesome. But most importantly, we know that, you know, children become readers in the laps of their parents. So these larger fonts help emerging readers find sight words, right? Or to track along. And uh, recently I received some feedback from a friend whose son does have some unique um, learning needs and challenges with reading and the extra white space and the larger font with no pictures made him feel a lot more confident because typically he would be given small little readers that you'd find in you know kindergarten or grade one and so this book actually made him feel confident with reading because visually his eyes could track and make it easier for him and his specific learning goals. Um, so that's, that's something that I, that I recently discovered and that was some really valuable feedback. And the surprise, a little bit of good news is that I am probably a week or two away from publishing book number two. So it will be 20 stories this time. This book has 24, it'll be 20 stories. Um, I'm hoping that I'll be able to get back into the studio and create the audio versions of them as well because the feedback so far on that has been, it's a great tool. Um, so I'd really like to be able to, to offer that as well. And that should be available probably in later, later this spring in a couple of months. Um, if you are interested in um, purchasing the book or subscribing on the Everyday Icing website, uh, you can click on the Get Started button. Subscriptions are $6 a month, um, which is, or sorry, $8 a month if you go monthly, $6 a month if you go annually. Um, I have a shop button on here where you can purchase the book. I ship all over the world. Um, and I also have a pre-sale for the second book on here already, if that's something that you're interested in. And more than anything, I love it if you send me an email at hello at everydayicing.com, and then I can sign and personal personalize your books. I absolutely love sending personal messages to kids of all ages who would like to add this collection to their library. So I hope that this has provided some inspiration for homeschooling, uh, giving you a new tool to use in your homeschooling kit or even supporting literacy and comprehension. So many parents of, uh, who have their children currently in public schools are saying, you know, the teacher told me my child is behind in reading and comprehension, but they're not behind enough to warrant extra help. So you parent, you need to take care of this on your own time. And I'm excited to offer them the blog as a tool and talk with them about using these stories and, and, and offering some, some ways of supporting um, literacy and, and comprehension as well. So thank you so much for allowing me to share this with you tonight. Um, let's make story schooling a thing. I think this would be a really great thing to add to the, to the world of education. Um, and, and I will sign off by saying, I sincerely wish that sharing a story is the sweetest part of every Wednesday, no matter how old you are. Thank you so much, Shauna. I have to just say, um, I have two boys and they're growing now, but, uh, neither one of them really enjoyed reading, but they loved being read to. So like, mm -hmm. even when they were teenagers, I would have read alouds like novels and stuff, but, um, and it's funny because just yesterday I was working with a child and she's a reluctant leader, uh, re re reluctant learner. She's struggling with reading and she's only eight, but um, I was just telling her the power of words. You don't, need a, you don't need to see a picture because the words create the picture. Close your eyes and I'll show you what I mean. And so I described this bizarre flower and yeah, it was so powerful. Anyways, so I, I love that you don't have illustrations, heavy illustrations in there because you're right, kids tune out and they get they get distracted by them. So 
when we want our kids to think critically as well. And so if you're being shown a picture, you're already instantly identifying with it and absorbing it as truth. Mm -hmm. I mean, we could, we could unpack that as adults even and what's going on in the world. But I think if we remove that factor, you rely more heavily on your own faculties. And then it becomes a bit more of discernment and, and intuitively connecting with, with what your own body is showing up and telling you and, and guiding you to think and see and believe. So, man, those are skills that I wish I had when I was a lot younger. And I'm in, excited and inspired to be able to offer it, to support it in, in kids who are interested in that, and especially see it in my own children. See how they're able to kind of, the girls can really connect in and discern for themselves what feels right? What doesn't? And I, and I think stories are a really easy way to start learning those skills. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. I love what you're doing. And I love the audio stories too, because there's a lot of kids that have that visual perception problem. So, you know, they'll probably never be strong readers, but they still love a story. Yeah. You know, right? yeah. Uh, DK, did you have your hand up or no? Okay. Joanne. Hi, Joanne. Oh, hello. Um, thank you for your presentation. I like your enthusiasm and what you do is, it sounds marvelous. So I'm also a teacher and I think, so I have two comments to make on what you've said. The one is, um, I think that if you teach children phonics with a, from a Socratic perspective, where you make them think what they're doing, mm -hmm. then you're really infusing them with that, with that um, mindset so that they have to question everything and they can't just accept it. The other things, I'm, I'm also an artist. Many of the children I come into contact with are amazing artists. Some of them have very have huge difficulties learning, but if they can express themselves in pictures and they do it alongside the writing, and that's what I found, they, they seem to, that block goes. But today I was in a class and we had to do paragraph writing. That's what the teacher wanted to do. And we did it and I said to them, if any, and I, I didn't teach them, it was just their first part. So I said, anybody can come up and read if they want to. So one boy, the most the posi most positive, sweet boy in the class came and started it. So it, st it wasn't a good, a, a good thing. But some of the children there really can't write anything or hardly. So one girl volunteered her friends to, to read. So I said, well, and then she said, I'll come and stand with her. But she didn't want to do it. At the end of all of it, and she showed me her writing. She could barely write. She came and stood up and she read her piece to the class and the teacher said she never does this so I think she felt I think through nature journaling they have something called fearsome Fridays where you show the work that you never want to show anybody or you think like it's the worst piece you've ever done you know so I was thinking like we should have fearsome writing Fridays where even if it's the worst piece you've ever done doesn't matter because somebody's gonna listen to it and there was one boy who was really big, like he can hardly write uh, phonics he can't even do the phonograms but he was doing pictures and then the boys were interpreting his his drawings which was hilarious <laughs> yeah, it was like morse code for owen so so i think what you i like your audio and i think what you do especially the spiritual part i just loved because i yes, do sir. that i think that that's what children are really missing they're really missing that especially now during COVID, where they their lack of connection is so apparent you know, I, would I would agree. Yeah, would agree. And, and that you're giving another alternative, which doesn't exist, didn't exist. Yeah. So thank you very much. I, I hope I didn't sound too critical. I always am a little bit critical. So no, I, 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 I sincerely appreciate the feedback. I think your comment as well about children being really brilliant artists and, and, and coming online. One of the things that I've done, I used to do live story time all the time and I loved it. Like actually being face to face with kids and reading stories is like my favorite. Um, I used to do a lot of that in the schools. One of the things that I do is I often, I have these little cardboard set up and boxes of crayons and, you know, I set up with a whole bunch of kids and I'd say, all right, here's your piece of paper. And I'd, I'd say, I have no, I have no pictures for you. I need you to give me a picture. And I'd go through three stories. And the first picture, the, the guidance would be, draw me what this story, um, what, draw me what you hear in the story, which is typically a very literal interpretation. And the second time I say, draw me on your paper as I'm reading you this story, what you're feeling, which then goes to that next level. And the third one is, what does that story that I'm reading to you make you think of? 
And so they have to then be able to project whatever they've been responding to in a different way. And I tell you, you know, the, the, the contributions were outstanding because they were given that opportunity. And I think, I think to your point of them being phenomenal artists, I've seen some absolutely brilliant things. So on exactly that point, in, in two classrooms, well, the one, the nature journaling and the science teacher was using a framework, you know, John Muir Laws uses that, I, want, I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you know about that, right? Mm -hmm. So that's exactly the same kind of thing. And I think if we start opening children up, I saw one child, she was hugging the tree. I told them to go hug the trees. Aww. and talk to the tree. So they, she was hugging the tree. I said, what are you doing? No, she's hugging the tree. So they, and then they were really, I think, you know, children take things so literally. You have to really be careful what you say to them because they'll really take it literally. And, and speaking of that, the one that absolutely drives me up the wall is I'm too old for a story. So I was doing story time at um, the Calgary Stampede for years. And so I did, oh my gosh, it was exhausting. I did three to four hours of story time a day for like eight out of the 10 days. And it would be in this public sort of arena and people, it was between the animals and the, the food in the bathrooms. So it was like all the families going through, it was just brilliant. And I'd call them all in to come and sit down. And it was extremely difficult for me to engage with a child over the age of 10 because they just thought stories are for kids. And that's something for me that I just have this personal mission. You know, when are we too old to cultivate presence in front of another person? And so that messaging that's out there is something that, you know, where, where is it coming from? Who's saying it? Where does that belief stem? And, and what can we do to help move through that? Because that's just be, like saying you can only be a good listener when the sun is out, or you can only be a good listener if you're sitting down. Like, no, that, that, that notion of presence is something that we need to cultivate in all arenas and in all opportunities at any age. So, yeah, that's a hot button for me. <laughs> Yeah, that presence and also I think the ability to be still. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm not. I'm okay with not being still. As I learned through meditations, kids need to move that energy through them. Mm -hmm. My youngest very much takes it all in, and she needs to physically um, to take out all of the distortions and all of that chaos. She needs to funnel it into her body to make sense of it, and she does that through movement. So she can be dancing and hopping around and singing and be fully engaged because she, what's going on around her is so engaging, she needs to move that through her body so that she can get her brain engaged. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, even the meditations, all of my guided meditations start with movement. They start with some kind of movement connected to the theme or the story so that kids can get into that space of clearing it all out and then engaging that part of their brain. I love it, I love it. Claudia. Uh... Shauna, thank you. Aww. You are an angel. Aww. You have manifested my dream Aww. bigger and better than I could have imagined. I have been dreaming of this. I have wanted to create this. I, I, met, um, I mean, this is so absolutely phenomenal. Mm. I... I connected with stories. I realized when my daughter was, um, she's 24 now and she was four, someone gave us these story tapes with stories from all around the world. And Johnny Moses was one of them. And I, I, my life transformed just listening to those stories. And I realized this is school. This is art this is everything everything that i would ever want to teach is in these stories and that that's the way the teachings used to come through and what a beautiful format so i i um uh, i named my business the golden hearth and um and i wanted to create a school based on storytelling I have no skills, no background in that. I mean, I, my background's in art, and but um, but an absolute passion and just I uh, just a knowing that that this is, I mean, this is the way that I see. Like I resonate with that, and how um, I've you know, and then so 
someone asked me, okay, can you teach a homeschooling class? And I thought, okay, well, what do I need to learn? What do I want to learn? I want to learn storytelling. I want to learn about storytelling. So I just said, okay, let's do a class on storytelling. But I have yet to buy the storybooks because I don't, I don't have access to go to a bookstore and look at them. I don't know what to buy. And I've just been sitting around just not knowing what to buy, but then we make up our own stories. And, um, and every time a child asks me to tell a story, I always do, and I make it up, even though I have zero talent or experience or anything. I just do it. I just do it. And they love it. And, and so I'm just so, so, so excited to look through your website. I want to learn everything. I want to use this as a resource. I want to learn from you. I want to know everything you're doing because... I really feel like this, to me, this is where my heart and passion is as a as school. Because it's, it's just so wide open and so beautiful. And so I'm just, thank you so, so, so much. And you're amazing. So I can't wait to, to read your stories and look through your website and, and use this in my class and yeah, so thank you so much. I'm so inspired. I, I couldn't sit in my seat. I wanted to jump up and down. <laughs> yeah, hooray, hooray, hooray. Aww. Claudia, that is so, I'm so grateful because there have been, you know, obviously ups and downs in this journey, but to be truly seen for what it is that I have on offer, knowing that I'm going to cry. Holy crap. Um, there have been so many that don't see what I have on offer. and I And I feel very much like I'm you know, somewhere between fighting for new space, but like trying to make sense in a traditional world that doesn't really make sense. So to be truly seen by you means sincerely the world to me. So I'm Aww. very grateful for your connection tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I hope I get to meet you. I hope Yay. I get, I want to hang out. I want we'll to chat together. I would, I would love to connect with you. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. That sounds fantastic. Yes, big yes. <laughs> Thank you. Actually, if you put your email, if you're willing to share, if you put yeah. your in the chat, then you can exchange them. And uh, yeah. also then, if you like, I can add you to our weekly, I just send out one email a week, just letting everybody know what we have going on. Yes. Okay. Thursday, yeah. so then you can just be on that list as well, if you like. Brilliant. Yes. 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 Thank you, Claudia. That was lovely. Uh, Joseph. Yes. I'll just, hold on, put my hand back down. There we go. Um, yeah, so no, great job. Excellent presentation. And I love your creativity. Um, I'm, I was a very loved and hated teacher when I was teaching because I'm not a fan of the public system. I know all the dirty secrets of the past and I studied all the different textbooks that were shoved under the rug. One thing about our school system almost worldwide is it's based off the um, industrial revolution when they were doing for all the plants. And so that's why I had the desks, the clocks, and they had it in fashion. And one thing I argued in a professor from England was that they're killing creativity and your mm -hmm. website and idea brings back creativity. That's what I love because every one of us in this room even is creative. But when we went to school, we probably felt bad in certain subjects because you're taught one way. But when I was teaching, I would teach four or five different ways that other teachers of school board hated, but parents loved it. Like, for example, everyone sees my background. In high school, I taught with virtual reality because a lot of people found history boring. Probably some of us did as well. I would put the VR on so that you'd go back and actually experience it instead of reading through a textbook. But along with your idea, I like how it's almost, you could reverse it one day where you're talking about the um, uh, too old for a story, which I'm with you. I think that's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. What I did, I didn't copy your idea, but I'm also saying you could do is that you have it where the kid can then pick a story for the adult because mm -hmm. kids love telling us stories. I love children that way. I think their stories are better than some adults can come up with, like their minds are endless. To give a little history thing, Picasso said it took him years to become an artist, it took him a lifetime to be able to paint as a, like, as a child, which if you take that quote into your idea and everything, even what I teach, it's that kids are always just classified as kids, but we were once kids. Like people look at time in the wrong kind of way. It's like these stages. So um, I hope I'm not rambling here, but I, I have so much... Um, <laughs> things I want to add or join in you on because I'd love to do it with my students um and then not I'm not uh preaching here but 
I like to incorporate faith. I don't like using religion because that's all political, but just the aspects of like virtues. And so I think yours also, if I was able to use in the future, like every month I teach like perseverance or patience. Like I pick one of the, the, all the famous virtues, which I was teaching kids. There's a difference between political religious stuff and then like stuff to do with like faith or, you know, the aspects of life, which I hope I'm not trampling on, on your ways of life, but uh, I, I mean it in a good way, I promise. Um, <laughs> so <allowed>. I hope, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I just, I, I don't have kids yet, but if I ever do and when I get back to teaching, I'd love to have this. Um, if I can say uh, normal, I don't mean to step on everyone here, but I'd love to include Shauna and most of you. I'm trying to do a TED Talk. So it got cut off by the pandemic, but it was supposed to be worldwide. I was going to do it in Vancouver. And part of my speech involved exactly what Sean was talking about, just the where education was and where it's going and how it should be. And part of my presentation involved the same topic she was. So I'd love if we could get this group and then Sean and even all you guys to join that because that TED Talks, I want to reach the world because mm -hmm. right now the politics are ruling it and they want everyone just head in the sand, not learning. I mean, they, they would trample this, but, you know, I say too bad for them. This is, this is the future. <laughs> this is. You yeah. know, you, you touched on something really important, um, something that my 11-year-old pointed out to me. And she said that, Mommy, you write the stories that you needed as a kid. And I do. I think when I look back over the 108 stories and the 30-some meditations or whatever it is and counting, they're the stories that I needed to hear. And so remembering that we were once kids, what I'm noticing with a lot of my stories is that as parents read them to their kids, there's sort of an inner child thing that goes on. Mm -hmm. There's maybe some healing. I mean, I've I have, uh, you know, you could, I could, we could have a coffee and I could say, you know, um, the sad little chickadee was pretty much my entire high school existence. <laughs> and we could dive into that or we could, we could look at, um, what's another good one? Colleen finds all the colors, which is about this chameleon who thinks she's a lizard because she can't change color. And as I've shared these stories or I've read them in classrooms or parents have listened while I've read to their children in a group, I've seen tears. And I recognize that there is that element of when did we forget to have fun? When did we forget to give ourselves permission to have joy? When did we forget to sit with our kids and experience it through their eyes? And so, you know, as much as everybody also wants to say, well, who do you write your stories for? And give me an age and give me a grade and give me a, you know, a, a window. Um, they're for everybody. It's just, what do you want to take out of it? And what are you willing to invest in it to explore? Mm. so I really enjoyed your I really enjoyed that comment because no thanks I, I'd love to if, if I do that because one thing when I did I did a bunch of seminars is that a lot of great like if I looked at all our report cards and this is a compliment to everyone we're probably a lot smarter than what we got labeled on paper not that everyone got low marks and that's pointing any fingers but what you're almost proving is what I tried to prove to parents and and different school districts is that if you say it's a C in reading or writing most times that's a grade on the teaching. Like as a teacher, as a leader, I always take full responsibility. I don't point the finger. It's usually on me. There's a new way, like, you know, a good teacher can learn from the student. So I think your way can also teach kids that it's not just about getting A, B, or C. Perhaps it's about those core aspects. And then, like you said, what's life instead of these um, stereotypes of life? You know, I mean, how it's been set up for the last 100, 200 years where we're all still kids where we're afraid to show it sometimes but if it can come out then what a great day and uh i think you're onto something there that i tried to to go so I, i'm rambling again but i just i got outside that it it kind of links to things i've tried to pass yeah, on but no i you make i i'm i'm with you man i'm appreciating okay. what you're what you're saying and i think you know my greatest wish um, would be that we as responsible adults who have an opportunity to create whatever the future looks like for kids is that we make it our absolute commitment to identify whatever it is in every single child that is before us, find out what makes them exceptional and raise the path to them. Because mm -hmm. if we all did what we were exceptional at, there would be no gaps, there would be no challenges, there would be no grumpy people, there would be no you know, depressed and upset teenagers. We would have people who grow into being, you know, who are creative and compassionate and engaged youth to be sort of satisfied and complete and whole fulfilled adults. Yep. So that's a bridge that I, that I, that I think stories can actually help us get there. 
Yes, I, I sometimes tell a story. It was actually a guest we had on here that told it originally, and it was a NASA study. Um, they were trying to determine genius, and so they put together like a test, and um, they gave it to, I think it was 1,600 four- and five-year-olds, and 98% of them came out as geniuses. And then they followed those same 1,600 kids up to when they were 30. And by the time they were 30, it was down to, I believe it was like 12% or something. It was just drastic. And even in the, in the first five years, it dropped from in the 90s to the 60s or something. It was like, wow. So what's going on that that's happening, right? That's, that's, we're responsible for that as the educators, I think. And I, and I agree with you, Joseph. If the kid is, if a child isn't learning, I feel that the teachers are failing them then. We're not, we're not teaching the way they need to be taught and everybody needs to be taught differently, right? Well, I tackled the board of BC for all the districts and all of them wanted to point the finger. They didn't want to take any responsibility, any blame. And I didn't like that. And she mentioned something in her presentation about, oh, her daughter. Uh, I had a very unique first education in teaching. A lot of teachers don't. Uh, a lot of FY people don't know this, but teachers often don't learn how to teach. No. And so they don't learn about the different learning styles. So her daughter is a kinesthetic learner. So not to give her a free idea, she can steal it all she wants. But if she did a creative story with like animals, for example, of each learning style, I think that'd be great because I learned a lot about that as an adult and became a unique teacher that way. But if mm -hmm. kids learn that, they wouldn't feel less than dumb or you know, all the negatives. Because I always say kids are the greatest because they're uncorrupted in life. I'm not saying we are, but the older you get, usually the world can corrupt them through stuff. So that what she's doing is right. You want to tackle them while they're young because that's what our opponents are doing, not to point any fingers, but mm -hmm. in the political world, they're trying to get kids young because they're impressionable. So I'm with, I'm with Sean here. If we can get them at this age, build them those building blocks and that kind of uh, internal armor, they'll be ready for the real world that wants to bring them down because I'm hugely passionate about that. I, I don't like the evil going on right now. Yeah, this, Simon. Is why, this, this is why I don't want to send my daughter to junior high next year. Yeah. My husband and I had that exact comp com conversation. If you imagine every child is, you know, having a mirror in front of them, which is their family or their parents or people who genuinely, sincerely love them and are going to support them to know that who they are is that reflection back to them. Mm -hmm. But you send them off into the wild, crazy world and there's a mirror of like peers and boys and schools and different teachers and activities and all these different mirrors. And it becomes this identity confusion of like, who am I? How do I need to respond in those situations? And so that internal compass kind of goes like, Ooh, I don't know where I'm going. Yeah. Yeah. So well, not, yeah. I, yes. One thing your books do too, is like the school system now, it teaches mistakes are wrong. That's not true. You have to make mistakes, learn in life. And even in university right now, I can't stand getting my second degree. I have to red tape for my career, but it's all memorization. If you get it wrong, you're this and that, but her books and this message that we could spread the world is, learning is okay but also mistakes is okay it's not just like memorize the right answer get this and all that because kids are being taught that since like kindergarten and i've been fighting against it in the public system but it's this endless battle because a lot of liberal teachers they just know nope, that's how it is that's what's going to be it's like but they're going to grow up to be like that as adults and you know lose the creativity that sean is trying to teach because creativity by i would say grease grade five or six in that system gets killed because they're taught like, no, you can't do this, can't do that. And th if her kids were in the public system, they would bring her home that. It's so, well, mom, that's wrong. That's this. But mm -hmm. there's no conversation. So I'm hoping this can open that door to what we all enjoy, which is, you know, giving back and helping the world kind of go around, you know? Yeah, when I'm, when I'm working with a child, if they make a mistake, and I agree, because failure is, there's no such thing, right? It just builds mm -hmm. resilience. It's, it's an opportunity to try again. And yep. we've talked about that a lot here in the think tank about resilience. And um, I don't ever have an eraser for a child when we're working. Mm -hmm. You don't need that. All you need to do, is, that's not a mistake. That's a really good effort. Let's yep. put a hug around it and try again. Yep. And that's the language I use. And, and like, it's a, it's a relief to children. They're like, oh, I didn't like screw up. <laughs> it's like, no, no, that was a great try. Way to go. Thank you for your effort. Let's try again. Um, DK. Yeah, just um, uh, uh, what's your name, Joseph? Yeah. Anyway, so someone was saying um something about how uh, encouraging mistakes, and uh, a couple of days ago, I, I made a 
a verbal distinction that I think is uh, maybe important. Um, instead of saying, oh, that's wrong, because wrong, the word wrong with it can sometimes carry a moral implication. You can just say, oh, it's just incorrect. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a good distinction to make. This is something I thought I'd offer. Um, and also on the same train of thought, um, well, yeah, so uh, Norma Jean, you're saying, um, oh, that's a mistake. You know, let's hug around it. So let's try again. Um, I think another, uh, to supplement that approach, you can ask them, hey, how can you gave that answer? So you can ask the child, what was their, their train of logic that might have led them to that answer? And see maybe, you know, if um, while you're still encouraging creativity, maybe you can, you know, sort of guide them in uh, maybe in the right direction. Or, or if they can explain their logic, maybe you'll, you'll learn something new. So I, that's just what I thought I'd offer. So with that, I yield. Yeah, I'm talking specifically about when I'm doing writing with a child. And, and you're right. It's not, I never say that's wrong. I never even use the word mistake. It's like, oh, that was a good try. Let's try again. But I also always ask eliciting questions to see if they can use logic and their critical thinking skills to, and Joanne will know what I'm talking about because we're both phonics uh, freaks. Um, and use use their the rules and the logic and, and critical thinking to think their way out of language difficulties. So it's it's it actually our approach really is all about developing um, critical thinking and getting kids to think their way out of things. So yeah, thank you. Uh, Joanne, your hands back up. All right, I just wanted to give you a little humorous anecdote. You know, so I've been I, I have a job three days a week, but I've been subbing so. I was in the one school and I give a very, like, I like to make it fun. And also if I make mistakes, that's fine. So the one little girl decided she was going to be my mentor teacher. So she says to me, Miss Melman, I think you should use the, the, the chimes, you know, to quieten the class. I said, do you normally do that? Not really, but you can try. I said, <laughs> okay. I know uh, how it first started was one of the little boys who's in my scout group happened to be in that class. So he was besides himself. He didn't shut up like for the entire day because he was so excited. But then he asked me what he should call me because Scout is different to, you know, the classroom. Then she says to me, Miss Melman, you know, why don't you try clap, clap, clap? clap. She kept on giving me hints about the control because the, the cl class was quite loud. And I thought that's so great that she felt comfortable enough to say that. And she didn't think that I was going to shout at her or feel like I should be completely in control, you know? But it was very funny. It was really, very funny. And then when we did the clap, 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 it did work. So I looked at her. I said, well, that was a good technique for five minutes. But then, you know, they reverted back to their normal behavior. <laughs> so we can always learn something. Yeah. Yeah, there are teachers as well, aren't they? Oh, absolutely. DK, did you, did you put your hand back up? No. Okay. Did anybody else have anything they wanted to uh, to add tonight before we wrap it up? I have one more one more thing. Sure, yeah. If anybody would like to hear a five-minute story, I'd be happy to read a story to everybody tonight. Yes, we would love that. We would love that. Thank you. Okay. Now or like, what are we? Are we yeah, I, um, I thought. Sorry, yeah, that wasn't very good. Okay. Did anybody else have any any other comments or questions before before Shauna reads us a story? Sorry. No, I think we're good. Yeah, everybody wants your story, apparently. Okay. <laughs> this, um, it's a five-minute story. It's even probably a little bit less than five minutes. And uh, it's called The Dragon at the End of My Leash. Every day, it demands to go outside. It bears its sharp teeth. Its hair turns to bristles. I'm given no choice. It must go for a walk or else but I won't dare walk it without a leash. The moment I clip on the leash, it becomes even more snarly and gnarly, fierce and ferocious. I cross my fingers and hope it doesn't eat me alive the moment we step out the door. We walk past the neighbor's house. They scramble to pick up their children and run them safely indoors. People cross the street when they hear us coming. They hear it roaring, huffing and moaning long before they see us come around the corner. The postman even hides behind the van until we pass. Its claws scratch the sidewalk and leave deep marks in its wake. It pulls me to the left. It pulls me to the right. It stops whenever and wherever and for whatever reason it likes. 
I have no choice but to follow and hold tight to that leash. It looks to the sky and notices a bird flying over the trees. What is it thinking? Lunch? A snack? Well, I hope it moves on before any blood gets shed. I want to hurry and go back home where it's safe. But it has a mind of its own. Oh no, it decides to sit on the grass and stretch out in the sun. Well, I guess even the most fearsome beast appreciates the soft grass on their belly. It wants to smell all the smells on the breeze. But I quiver and shake looking over both shoulders, fingers crossed so no one gets too close, hoping and praying that nothing startles it, because that would be trouble. So I breathe and I wait, anxious and nervous. Not soon enough, it decides to go home. It chooses the long way, but I don't complain. It's moving in the right direction. I'm faster now, so I run to keep up. I am thankful its wings are too small to lift us off the ground. I imagine if it could fly, I would become the string attached to a fire-breathing balloon floating high overhead, and the thought terrifies me. Well, we're almost home now, and my heart is racing. It moves faster once it sees the house. I run along behind it. It doesn't stop until we're on the front step and I open the door and let it back in the house. I slowly reach down, making no fast movements to unclip the leash. With the leash removed, its teeth fold back into its jaw and its scales disappear. It no longer huffs and puffs and wants to breathe fire so I can relax. Exhausted, I sit down on the couch to recover and my fluffy little dog jumps up on the couch and wants to cuddle again because it's tired from our walk. Phew, the dragon is no longer at the end of my leash. The end. Oh, that was wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> That's fantastic and I have a dog like that. <laughs> I've had a dog like that. <laughs> oh, that was really good. That was so colorful. Thank you. Yes, I was closing my eyes for it just to imagine it it's very I love I love words and and how it creates imagery like that right it's so fabulous thank you and I don't I don't believe we should ever write down to children either and opt for small words or easy words or less complex words for any reason so I have lots of big words in my stories absolutely how else do they learn vocabulary really okay. right it's, yeah. it's putting it in context like that that they that they start to absorb it for sure that was wonderful. Thank you so much. Does anybody have any comments after that? I'm manly raising my hand. Okay. <laughs> uh, no, another good job. And um, I think that last point is what I was, we were already talking about, but just learning is such a, a big universal. It's just a big ball of, there, there's no like just linear way, in my opinion. And I think you touch on that where learning different words just learning in general, but not the typical learning I was talking about. Drawing back to a way where it's a new path, a new journey. And I, I can't prove it yet, but I think even when I do my TED Talks, hopefully one day soon, I'll be showing stuff like this of just the difference it makes through children starting at any age. But then if you fast forward, like interview them like 20 years later, that maybe they're still having, you know, that story time where they want it, or they're taking those story time lessons. Like, I love stories because that's a good way to learn anything in life. Like I could tell a story about this meeting with us all. I, I've loved this journey so far. It's been a story in itself for all characters, but I think, and then someone in the comments made about humor. I was going to say, I haven't read your books yet, but humor is a very powerful learning tool that I taught to many, well, I tried to in the public system, but um, if anyone knows here, we all learn when we're laughing. Like you could watch a funny show. We could have a laugh here in this meeting. You could have a laugh with a child. You will remember that for 50 years. And I will, I will stand strong as anyone wants to argue that. But um, I think that if that was thrown in there too, not maybe you already have, that's the best of both worlds because, you know, a kid can't appreciate it any better. And they don't get that from a lot of sources now. It's, true. it's a lot of like, because they're on tablets now and they're kind of doing lazy, not you, but other parents and stuff it's all visual stuff or stuff they're not really learning or, you know what I mean? So you focusing on those words, the time, the elements, the, the imagination picture part of it, which then you could build your own pictures. Uh, you know where I'm going with this. I'm, I'm just saying that's, that gets the ball rolling. So um, sorry. And just my teacher side's coming out and getting me all excited again. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Yeah. The power of play, right. And humor always, always use that. 
Claudia. Yeah, this is exciting. I was it just reminded me of um, a book that I got from my my Brima teacher, um, Malachek Mushan. It's called Stories My Grandfather Told. And um, it's about teaching stories from like Sufi and from the uh, Kur Kurdistan and all these places around there. And um, my, I used to read them to my daughter and they all leave you with a question and things to ponder. And it didn't matter how old she was as I was growing up. She always loved to hear them, even though she, she really didn't know what to make of it. But the thing was, is the, the stories moved me so deeply that I, I couldn't get through them without crying for most of them. And so I could read them to my daughter, but I, I never felt comfortable reading them to other people because I would cry. And, um, but then I started at, I, I was going to a coach, like a therapist coach. And then I would always end with, I would read her a story and she loved it. And it didn't matter that, that I cried. And then, and she said, oh, it's okay, you can cry. And, and then so I started reading them to my, um, the kids, the storytelling. And even then I could still cry and, and it, was all, it was all okay. And, and it was just really taught me that the fact that it moves me so deeply is so fascinating to them. It's like they, they pick up something because I'm, I'm an empath and I just, I, there's no possible way I cannot feel. And so I just, I just thought that's another layer, you know, of the stories and, and how, how they make, how they elicit these deep feelings. No idea what it is. It's so powerful. Another demonstration of the power of words, right? Yeah. Yeah. And the transmission, it's transmission. That's what, that's what it is. You don't know what it is, but something's coming through. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Beautiful. Yeah, I can remember reading Where the Red Fern Grows, one of my all-time favorite kids' books. And, oh, my God, opening, opening paragraph, I'm crying. And my boys are like, Mom, why are you crying? <laughs> I was like, because it's going to be sad. <laughs> yeah, Sean, you know the story, right? Oh, yeah. It's, oh, yeah. Such a fabulous story. But um, anyways, yeah, I, I never think it's a bad thing to show our, uh, that we can be emotional about stuff. It's good. It's good. Anybody else have any other comments or questions? Or Thank you so much, Shauna. I can't thank you enough for joining us this evening, for sharing this wonderful tool and all the work you've done and your inspiration and your big heart for kids. Uh, we very much appreciate it. And um, I know uh, you do have something on the, uh, on the portal too, don't you? Which yes, is I do. awesome. Yeah. So you can always find Shauna's stuff on the portal. Uh, I've also put her um, webpage in the chat a couple of times as well. If any, if you want to save the chat, you guys can, there's just those three little dots there um, down on the bottom right corner and you can save it. If there's anything you wanted to grab the different um, addresses and links and whatnot. Uh, if you haven't put your email address in the chat and you'd like to be part of the email week weekly list so you're always up to date, go ahead and put that in there and I'll add you. Um, again, thank you, Shauna. Is there, I don't think we have any like news that we have to cover today. So uh, if you haven't explored Life Force Canada, the other pillars, I encourage you to do so. We've got some really great things going on in the health and wellness and the agriculture and energy think tanks and stuff so if that's your bag yeah join there too all right you guys have a thank wonderful you. weekend thank and you for having me thank you all so much well i hope you'll come back shauna hope you join us again. we'd love to have you part of our community this is yeah. amazing amazing well, I, i'm i'm inspired and excited and uh now that i kind of have my feet on solid ground i feel like i'm more able to just really engage so yeah, well, you know what? I'm going to be in Calgary. I'm going to be driving out next week. So maybe we can even get together for a coffee. That would be lovely. I would love that. That would be wonderful. Yeah, great. Great. So I have your emails in. The, uh, oh, I can find you on your website too. Yeah, I, it's in there. Shauna at everydayicing.com. Um, I'm in there. Yeah. Right, I've already emailed you. What am I talking yeah. about? Oh, good. <laughs>
Okay, you guys, have a lovely night, everybody. Have a great weekend. I hope it's sunny wherever you are now that spring has sprung. And thank you to everybody new that joined us. Very happy to have new faces. I hope you'll come back. And to everybody that joins us every week, thank you. I, I very much appreciate it. You guys are a great group. It's, it's always inspirational. Thank you.